Yeah, hello and welcome everybody to our very first webinar or very first technical seminar on our MEMIT series. All the best for 2024. I hope you survived Christmas or whatever you've done in the time between the years. And now you're ready to scope with some of the more specific features um, of NVMet, like the, the water spray feature. So just a brief thing. So our webinar, this is a new series, and we're also using a new software. So we're not really um, having a used StreamYard quite a lot of time. So please forgive us if there is something not working uh, as expected. So maybe we switch back to Zoom later on in the next webinars, but we're going to experience a bit of other software tools to see what will be the benefits of that. So for us, welcome for me. Um, these um, webinars, um, including the question and answer session, I have just copied a link below the event on, on LinkedIn. So if you use this link, you can also enter the studio with your webcam, your microphone and your name. and um, just be a part of um, the discussion later on. So basically we have uh, 40 minutes, around about 40 minutes, where we talk about the technical features. So it's especially more technical oriented um, stuff. And afterwards, we hopefully have a little question and answer session so that everyone can join, join us. So um, although it has been running quite a lot of time, um, we can anticipate that um, next summer or in the north the southern hemisphere it is already summer will be hot again and I don't need to tell you a lot of things about heat mitigation strategies and why it is important to mitigate heat stress in urban areas and in all areas at all and one of the features which are very very effective when we come to discussing different metallurgies is on um, water spray features and so it's not surprisingly that a number of people are asking, how can I, I model water spray features in Envimet or can I model water spray features in Envimet? You definitely can because other people have done that before. But it's one of the most, um, say, difficult or advanced stimulation features. So I will guide you a little bit through, through the concept of that and show you how can you integrate these water features. Um, this includes everything that has to be done with water in a spray form that could be fountains from um, open waters. This could be sprinklers, nozzles, or whatever technology you think of where liquid water is sprayed or <clears throat> dispersed into the air. So this is just a big group of different um, features all based on motion of water attaching the air. So let's have a look at these. Um, so um, as, as promised, um, this is also um, uh, linking to um, a case study we have just presented um, this week um, about Rethink Athens. So I will just briefly talk about this case study later on because it's, it's pretty old, it's over, two, over 10 years now, but it doesn't matter because the, the, the problems and the solutions, the prob possible solutions to these problems are all, of course, the same like 10 years ago. So just a very brief overview, what are the good things and what are the bad things when we talk about water cooling um, as an invasive form of urban planning to reduce air temperature, basically. So there are, of course, two obvious benefits. The one thing is that um, it is very effective when it comes to cooling down the air because um, we can easily achieve five Kelvin, six Kelvin, or even seven Kelvins of air temperature reduction in the proximity of the, the water feature. This is quite a lot, and it's hard to achieve that with other technologies like shading, um, different materials, and, and other purposes. Just simply because um, the water feature, the evaporation of the droplets um, directly interacts with the surrounding air, so they take their energy required to evaporate from the energy from the entropy of the surrounding air package. So there is no need to go the way over different surfaces. So first shade, it, shade the surface, then the surface has a reducted um, temperature. And then in the next step, it cools down maybe a bit the um, air above it. So it's 
acting directly into the air volume wherever the water spray feature is directly it's in it, so it's very very effective and second good thing is um, it's very decorative no question or most people love water there are different attitudes regarding the question do they like to get wet from the water or not so that depends on age time of year and so on and so on but in general i think it's very easy to combine with existing features um, like moving waters, still waters, waterfalls, or whatever you can think of. Water is always um, a very pleasant feature to integrate in the, the urban setting. So these are the, the, the positive points. But we also have to make sure that we um, think of uh, two, three other things which are also critical. So for one thing is um, we definitely need clean water. So we have not the usage of gray water in, in no way. We can use black water for um, any water spray features that are going into the air because um, otherwise we're getting into the risk of spreading bacteria, urinary diseases and all other things related to, to water misted into the air. This is something we definitely uh, do not want to have. Then secondly, um, if you want to have small droplets, which are the most effective one because they evaporate very, very quickly, you need energy to produce them. And finally, um, the, the, the water spray evaporation obviously only works if we have a water vapor deficit. So if your relative humidity approaches 80%, then the water spray feature begins to be not very effective in the way it works. So for the wet tropics, it's probably not the best solution to do. Okay, so we, we talked uh, what's not so what should we think of when we use water spray features now let's have a look at the water spray feature itself and this is where we make it just a, a small journey into greece um visiting the city of athens and um a competition that was raised in uh, 2013 so i said 10 years ago now uh, from okar landscape architects in utrecht in the netherlands and this we were part of the team so we were not the designers obviously we were the the guys who did the simulation to <clears throat> assess the, the outcomes of the different design strategies proposed by Okra. And this competition was raised by Onassis Foundation and Okra and the team with Okra won the first prize. So very nice. And so just to give you some ideas, so it was not only about um, nature-based based solutions, so it was a holistic approach, including traffic um, concepts, um, social concepts, so everything you might think of um, when it comes to restructuring an existing urban area. So just a, a few renderings, just to give you an, an impression. Some of the things have been built, like the extension of the tram line. You see just you're passing through the, the rendering. Others have not been built, like the complete reconstruction of the, the places here. Um, but it's a good vision, and maybe if we have some more time, things are approaching. And um, this is as Athens looked like in 2014. So um, not too much of vegetation and definitely a, a good idea to think of some urban redesign strategies here. So let's have a look at one of the squares. So it was not, a, um, this project was not uh, fitting the complete area of the Athens, it was much too large, but it focused on some of the places and some of the streets. And one of the places I have picked here is the Omonia Square. And this is in the redesign idea of Omonia Square. And this is the Omonia Square, how it was uh, before. So this is Omonia Square. So you see, this is um, all what's happening here, vegetation. And definitely, um, there is a huge change concept involved. It's involved on vegetation, it involved a lot of changes in material, um, both on the, the ground materials, but also using um, wood materials and other natural materials to create an additional shading overhead. And of course, it's in included um, water features on different levels. This is why we've selected this example. So little fountains, little water sprinklers in this areas of the, um, the streets and little water fountains here as well. So. It turns out to be quite a good example to show that for the question, what can we do with water spray features and what is the, the, pro the possible effect of it? 
Yeah, so this was the vision. And now we did our um, modeling work. Of course, that's where we were part of the team. And um, here on that side, on the left-hand side, you see the model for um, Omonia Square, how it was today before any uh, redesign features have been done. And on the other side, this was the vision. Of course, in the model displays, you cannot see everything. So the materials cannot be shown in, in one figure. And also, you don't see the, the water spray features. But it will be very soon very clear where they are located, especially here and there. So these were the locations where we had a lot of water ponds and also a, a lot of um, fountains introduced to see what will be the cooling effect. Yeah, so now drawing of that. Yes, some classical simulation results. So if you have worked with microscale models like, like Envimet, you probably uh, know how these um, results look like. So we pick a day, a typical day in Athens, for example, a hot summer day. We just took July the, the, third, <clears throat> the 31st, or oh, hard to say. Um, just having a look at the, the air temperature distribution over Ammonia Square, it's pretty clear um, that this place has no overcasting of shade. It has no significant cooling features. So it's just hot everywhere, ranging up to 36 degrees centigrade, almost in the center of the place. So definitely not a public place where you would like to stay um, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And it's not getting better in, unless you wait until um, 8 or 10 in the afternoon in the evening. So now let's have a look at the features. So we will later on in the, in the technical part show, how, show you how to implement these water spray features. So this is just to show you what can be the effects if you do integrate these water spray features here. And you see, for example, the positions of the different fountains here and there, and the significant change in air temperature it immediately generates at the position where it evaporates. And also, as the wind is progressing, it is also being transported down in the street. So um, this is another interesting feature um, because normally this depends on the question, um, do I want to get wet or not? If I say, okay, I don't want to get wet. Um, then of course the spray feature stays where it is. It also means if it starts to get windy, you maybe have to turn off the spray feature because it's going to be blown into the streets. But if you say it's okay, if there is a fine level of uh, fine mist, you can also allow that mist to penetrate into the adjacent streets. So then of course we can extend this cooling effect even more away from the fountain, away from the water feature we have introduced. And then we have really have a quite a large area where we effectively can cool down the air. So this is uh, the plot in absolute temperature on that side. And here you see the change of temperature and you see it goes down four Kelvin, could be even five Kelvin or six Kelvin, depends on a lot of features. And this is of course something because it makes it an interesting feature to simulate because there are quite a lot of interactions that define what will be the effect of water spray. So it's not only the environmental situation, what is the air temperature of, what is the wind speed? What is the humidity of the air? It's also the technical features of the water spray. What are the droplet size distributions? Do I have very fine droplets or is it more larger droplets? What is the flow rate? How many um, liters of water do I intend to evaporate into the air? So there is quite a lot of things, a lot of settings giving a result or the other result. Yeah, so uh, example for PET, so that's my, my, my favorite um, thermal comfort index. Um, of course, if you like UTCI or SET or um, OutStar, um, then you're welcome, of course, to use that one. And you see this is uh, the thermal comfort, or you cannot call that thermal comfort. This is the dis thermal discomfort map for um, the old Ammonia Square. And very nicely, um, you see the result of the redesign, and of course, um, as in the, in the thermal comfort map, we see the effect of everything, the air temperature, the wind movement, and the, the shading effects you see. 
a contribution of everything, the, the small trees shading, the water evaporating, the different surfaces um, produced. So it's a very nice implementation of different um, mythologies, some nature-based, some are not nature-based. Um, but we're going to focus on the water spray because this is the one I want to introduce to you, how you can use that in your NVMet simulation. So um, there's also a suggested reading, of course, it's a bit science-based. Um, if you like to have um, insights into the um, exact numerics behind it, so there's a very nice paper uh, written by Elisa and, um, and her team that's published in, in Energy and, and Buildings. It has a pretty lot of pages, it's very impressive. And it has includes on real time uh, real world experiments. It includes a combination of the uh, different equations and so on and so on. So very very nice papers. And I think it's open source to be read. So at least I could download it yes, without any restrictions. Okay, so here we are. So let's th think about how can we implement the sources in our NVMet model. And this is um, maybe a bit tricky, but not too tricky, because there are some things you need to know. The first thing is um, NVMet uses the water spray as a pollutant source. It's, of course, not a pollutant like PM or SO2 or, or, or whatever, but it basically um, has the same behavior because it's a particle, water particle released in the air, being transported with the airstream if operating depending on the wind and local climate conditions. So it just makes absolute sense to put it in the same definition case in the same database um, as we have for the um, other sources. So the way to tell NVMet that your source is a special source is to use this um, special ID. We go to that later on again, because there are two kinds, two types of water spray sources we can have in NVMet. The type number one, this is where we use the special ID one. This is meant as a fountain so that we define a height of the source, maybe five meters or so. And what we mean, it's a fountain which goes from the ground up to the level of five meters. So everything between this five meter level and the, the ground base is water fountain. So here maybe it's not a water fountain in this picture, but in NVMet it would be a complete water fountain. So that's the option number one. And the other option, we can have both mixed in the model, so you can have as many sources as you like. This is um, a, a classical spray outlet or a nozzle or a sprayer or whoever you would like to, to call this kind of thing. Um, this is identified with setting the special ID to the value of two. And this is the only function for the special ID in this case. And that means, okay, um, this is not a fountain, but this is um, some kind of sprayer and it's located in the height of 15 meters in this example, exactly. So there is nothing in between. There is just this nozzle, this sprayer in 15 meters and it emits the water spray. So one, at the first time it seems a bit confusing, um, but um, very soon you, you will figure out this is uh, very easy to do. And the second thing we also need to define is, of course, um, the amount of water this is released by the source, because this can be very, very different to depending on your system you have. If you have a very thin layer of air, of water, or you can have a very massive fountain. But that's very simple. Uh, because what people normally have for their misting system is a flow rate in liters per hour or per minute or whatever, normally in liters per hour. So, And uh, what NVMet wants to have in the, in the database manager, we will just jump into the database manager and look at it in real time, is that um, we, we define a source strength in grams per second for each hour of the day from zero in the night to 11 p.m. in the after, in the evening. And you can have um, your own emission rates for every hour of the day. So if it says it obviously won't make much sense to uh, make water spray 
activities in the nighttime. So then, of course, you can set this value to zero. So it will just uh, start to spray the water in the midday hours or in the early afternoon. And the calculation is pretty simple. So just assume um, that you know my nozzling system releases uh, 30 liters per hour from a single nozzle. So of course you have to have this information, but um, if you have installed such a system or you have selected such a system, uh, you do have this information because it's a basic information. Um, and this is easy to convert. So if I know it's 30 liters per hour, then I know a, a liter, this weights um, 1,000 grams. So that means 30 liters per hour is equal to 30,000 grams water per hour. Or as we need the grams per second, we just have to divide that by 3,600. And then we will have the emission rate of this system of 8.33 grams per second. This is, of course, more easy if you have a technical system like a water spray nozzle system where you have a pump and you have a water supply for um, a fountain it's of course a bit more difficult um, because for the one thing you don't know exactly the emission rate of your source uh, of your fountain and for the other thing you don't know exactly the size of the droplets that are emitted from the fountain so you maybe have to make a, some some tests or some assumptions to to find a realistic emission but if you talk to the people operating this um, system they will have a very clear idea of how much water they lose in on a hot day in their system so you will get, get a very good rough estimate on how much of this water is evaporated through the fountain plus a little bit of amount evaporated from the the water surface itself if there is an additional open water surface so that's basically um all we need to know for the moment. So I will close this on. And just jump into a real case study. This is now not reading Athens. Um, this is um, our classical NVMet example, our um, layout. You can download this example from our um, <clears throat> info site because it's used in several case studies. It's a very simple model. It's not large, it's 100 by 100 grids. So that means that it is calculated easily on a very regular standard PC overnight. This is why I've selected that. So um, what I would like to do is to add some water features in this model. So I've designed the model, I have designed the trees and the, the surfaces. So everything you normally do on when you build an environment model, it's the same here. And in the end, it's your choice. Now do I want to add some water features, fountains or nozzles in a combination or only fountains or only nozzles and how many of them and so on. So it's completely up to you. So the one thing we need to do is, of course, like everything, like for the trees, like for the surface materials, we have to go to the database because every type of nozzle, every type of fountain have to be defined in the database. So like every tree has to def be defined in the database before I can use it. So I keep that open and just jump into the database manager. You know that guy? Just a minute for it. Okay, here we go. I select the correct project, of course. Don't forget that because if you use a project database, like you see here, all the, the folders, the dark folders, these are indicating that I use a, a project database. And of course, I have to select the project because otherwise, I will not have all the nice stuff which is located in my project database otherwise. So we go over to sources and I have already defined two pieces of source, a water fountain with the identifier 0000 MWW and a spray source 000 again and SS as spray source. So just as an example, so if you want to have 20 different pieces of source with different emission rates, with different heights, no problem, you can define as many as you want. 
but let's make our life easy for the moment and just say we have well, just two types. So one is the fountain type and the other one is the spray source type. So I just gave it a name. I say for the water fountains, it's just uh, this, this um, fountain I have shown in the presentation. So I said it has a default height of five meters and the special ID says it's an special ID one to show it's a fountain and it's not a spray nozzle somewhere in the height of five meters. And we have to set the emission profile for each hour of the day. And this is exactly what, what I meant. So if you know it's 10 liters per hour or 20 liters or 30 liters, you make this little conversion. And then you have um, the emission rate of, for example, 8.2 grams per second, and you can set it for every hour of the day. Again, I was very lazy and I just took the same value except of the, the very late night hours and the very early morning hours. So my water fountain is practically on all the time. So I did the same for the spray source. So this is now a nozzle in a height of 15 meters and it's only in 15 meters. There's nothing below it except maybe um, pedestrians. Um, that means special ID two. So the, the, the software knows it's not a fountain, it's a nozzle at that height. And again, I set on the emission profile and I used a, a little higher value because these nozzles can um, evaporate, uh, can spray, not, of course, a bit more uh, water than uh, just a fountain where the, the, the droplet is just released more or less accidentally when the, the water fountain falls down. Okay, once we have finished that, we're done. So there's, at this point, nothing more to do. We have our two sources. We have, of course, to remember them. We save our user database. Oops, not, not S. Oh, it's already saved. Okay, I don't need to save it because I haven't changed a thing. So I can go back to, to spaces into my design and switch over here to sources in this part of the section here. And you see, I have already placed some sources because uh, we have just an hour time. So I, I selected two areas in this model. So I thought this little place here, um, this is a nice location to place my water fountains. So this is WW, so this is the water fountain, or actually I have used three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. And for this little street here um, in the south of the area, I have selected um, as the location for my spray. So my spray source SS as an um, database ID. Um, it's also, you can look, look down at the bottom of the screen if you don't remember what was SS, what kind of data thing was it. And it says it's the spray source here and it's the water fountain over here. So there's nothing else to do. So of course, if you want to have more fountains, put in more fountains. If you want to have more sprinklers, put in more sprinklers in different heights and different locations and so on and so on. So you're finished with that. Save it, of course. Um, I have not changed anything, so I just wanted to save that. Um, okay, so as you remember, um, for an MVMET simulation, there are always two people playing together. The one guy is the in an you know, X file. I have just created using the, the spaces module. And of course, on the other hand, I need the SimX file to control the simulation settings. And this is the location where I have to put in some information about the spray. Okay. So we can just, um, I will just um, create a new fresh CMX file because um, it's always good to, to um, show this two, two or three times. So I select my, my project, of course, urban layout in this case, and now it's the standard procedure. So um, it's not very much you need to do. So you have to select, of course, the date for the simulation. So this is all shown in, if you don't remember how to do that or you have not done it before, um, go to our website um, or our videos are partly are already remade for the version five. Others are just in that really more in this recent moment reproduced for the version five. And there is a detailed explanation how to create this mix file. So 
it's a bit fast forward now. So I choose the date, so say the 1st of July, that's fine, starting hours, we can leave everything as it is. And now say just sim with water. And this also sim with water. We keep the model folder as it is. And of course, as information, I need to define my urban layout INX file so that the simulation knows where my wonderful water sources are located. So same for metrology. So we just use simple forcing. So very easy. You can just define a day, say with a maximum temperature of 30 or not 39, nice, a bit hot maybe, of 37, minimum temperature maybe of 36. And also I would select a dry day. So I want to see my water spray feature in full action because I have just mentioned as wetter the air gets, the less effective the water spray evaporation obviously will be due to the um, decreased vapor pressure deficit, deficit, deficit. Okay, that's fine. Finish with that one. So still standard. Now, this is the only section, this is the only step you need to do if you want to use water spray features. You need to add one additional section or one optional section. You go to add optional section. And as I said, this um, water spray is treated as pollutant source. So we need to add a pollutant section. So doing that, and there's not too much you need from that one. So in Envimet, you have always the choice. Do I want to have single pollutant mode? To, that means I have just one pollutant that is um, simulated, or do I want to have a multi-pollutant mode where I have up to six different pollutants in parallel? But as I'm only interested in water spray for the very moment, I just use the single pollutant mode. And I also don't need um, chemistry because there is no chemistry involved when I just use water spray. So we can things we keep things very easy. The only thing I had to set is below here to say I name my pollutant water spray. This is just a name. You can give it any name you want. This does not have any technical functionality. It's just for you that you remember what this user form of pollutant is, um, what, it, what it is. And we select the chemical spice uh, species or the type of pollutant, and then we choose water spray. So that's the lowest point in the list. And it be, you get an additional question, what will be the particle diameter? So then again, this has something to do with your technical setup. <clears throat> of course, um, if you have a water spray system, it doesn't matter if it is a nozzle system or if it is a water fountain, of course, it does not generate particles of exactly one size. That's completely impossible. But if you have a water spray system, your manufacturer can tell you uh, if you put operate it with um, this and that pressure, you will get a particle distribution from say in six micrometers to maybe 20 micrometers. So that's the range of particles you can expect coming out of your nozzle um, if it's new and fresh and clean. And also the mean of your um, particle distribution will be, for example, 10 micrometers. So this is, of course, something I have to set here. This is also the default setting, 10 micrometers. I could also say 8 micrometers. It depends. If you have a very high pressure nozzling system, which is very expensive or very um, hard to keep clean, you can, of course, have very, very fine droplets, which can create an extremely fine mist, which evaporates almost immediately. As it leads a lot of power to operate, is very sensitive to any kind of dirt in the this, in this system. And um, yeah, it's also very expensive. So most water spray systems operate about 10 micrometers or 15 micrometers. And if it's, if it's a fountain, it's probably even bigger because the droplets from a waterfall or from a falling um, pump, water pump will be around 50 or to even 100 micrometers. OK, we set this. The density remains the same. It's the same for all particles. And then we are finished. And we can just save this SIMX file, give it a name. I already have given it a name, so I just can call it test. Yeah, there we are. We are finished with that. So 
what comes next, of course, is um, you have to do a simulation. And normally you just do not one simulation, but you do two simulations. You do one simulation without your water spray features, and you do another simulation where everything is kept the same, or not necessary, everything kept the same, but in our case, it's the same simulation, but with the water features enabled. Of course, I have um, prepared that because it takes too long to, list, to look at this um, element simulation in a webinar. So it actually just took that on a regular PC just seven hours to calculate for this um, example model. So, and I have opened that, I've downloaded the files already in Leonardo. So and I will have a look at the, the air temperature, for example, at um, uh, 14 o'clock. Selecting air temperature, selecting a level, maybe two meter, two point six meter, and say an extract to three D, uh, two D, sorry. So this is the first. This is the simulation. Um, we had for the set A, and the set A. This is the water layout with water. So you already see it. This was the area where our water fountains are located. Let's have a look at the same situation without the water features, because we want to make a comparison later on. Also same time step, 14 o'clock. This would be our set B then. So we can always have two sets at the same time in Leonardo, so we don't need to reload the files one and again. And say we don't have a look at set B extract. So have a look at this bubble here while I press the button. And you see it's gone because in this set, there are no water spray features. So what about the spray here? The spray here is located in uh, 15 meters. So I will have to move a bit more upwards to see an effect. We go down to 10 meters and switch again to file A. Now we need to make a, co a comparison of the two files. And it's much more obvious. Otherwise, we will have just the, the temperature distribution effect. So now I have made a, a comparison. You probably know that from Leonardo. So I will take one file and subtract the other file. And then I get an idea on what is, for example, the change of air temperature in absolute um, values. So you see this bubble, which is still from the fountains. I'm, I'm a bit high there. The fountains are stopping at five meters and I'm in 10 meter height. So probably it's a better idea to go deeper, uh, lower to, to the ground surface to have a more realistic impression of what's going on here. Yeah, so here you see the effect here um, is about um, 0 0.7 Kelvin. So it goes even up to 0 0.93, depending on, on the scale. Yeah, so, it's, so the maximum effect is around um, one Kelvin air temperature reduction achieved by these, um, I think it was seven or eight little fountains. And the water spray, of course, has a little effect only. It's hardly visible. Um, we have to go higher up into the atmosphere to see, uh, oh, sorry, it was the wrong button. I wanted to just make a compare. And if you go higher in the atmosphere, of course, you also see an effect of a reduction of uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 Kelvin. So it's much less effective. But as I said before, even if this um, nozzle is maybe um, transpiring more water, it probably is not in the best location in the model area. So the same nozzling system would have probably a much better performance if I have removed it to a different location. I just put it in the webinar just, just for, a, for a test. But there are already trees included in that street, and there is already shading from the other side of the street. So it's definitely not the hottest street, and therefore it's not probably the best location to give a maximum performance of this um, sprinkler system. But our water fountain system works very well. What about the air humidity? How much 
spray is left over. So this is um, an example question, an interesting question. Um, if you want to um, concentrate on the question, do pedestrians get wet or not? So I could have a look at the um, water spray concentration by just selecting the, the variable. And here you see how many grams per meter are still in the air. So we are releasing the water spray here and also the water spray here. And um, what you see here is um, that the, there is a little bit of transport of water mist away from the water fountains, but it's not really much. So it's, it stays really concentrated on the locations where the water feature is and where the little fountains are. So there's probably no reason to, to worry that um, people are going to complain that they're getting wet because only here there's a little chance of getting wet, but if you don't want to get wet, you don't need to pass exactly there. It's a bit different for the sprinkler system. So if I go down to the ground surface um, at two meter, 7.7, yeah, but also yeah, there's, there's still some water mist left. So um, for the water sprinklers, it, uh, the situation is exactly the case um, that not all of the water spray is actually evaporated. Some is hitting the ground surface, not, not much, but there is a chance that people are getting wet. So this is probably the same effect as I just mentioned before, because it's not the best location. That means it's not that hot, so not every water is evaporated that is available. So if it's not evaporated, it's falling down to the ground and make people wet. Yeah, okay. So um, basically, um, this is the, the end of the, um, the technical show. So we have just browsed through, just to give a, a brief summary. So water spray features are pretty complex. They're comp a bit complex, more complex than normal MVMET simulations, but they're also complex in the final evaluation of the results because there are so many aspects we need to consider. How much water do I evaporate? What is the best location? You cannot put water spray features everywhere because you need water and power supply, for example. What is the most effect? Can I evaporate all my water or do I have, have, do I have the problem that water is sprayed onto everything? Ich sehe hier so ein so paar Comments sehe ich hier. Siehst du diese hier? Die ganze Frage, ja. Da fragen yeah. Leute was. Ja, yeah. wir sind in der Question Section. Reicht? Okay, so um, I was just was asked by Daniela if I do see the, the questions. Yeah, I do see the questions. I don't know if I see all the questions because I don't know how many are there, but I see uh, one, two, three um, at the moment. So I will just go over that. So um, I hope, I hope um, that was um, a very brief and very quick summary of how to introduce water spray features. And you see, if you have a real project where you want to introduce water spray, uh, you know there's a lot of technical discussion always in the project, and then you have to transport these technical information also into your, your model setting to get it get accurate um, simulations of that. Okay, so let me turn over here to the, um, the questions. Okay, there. this was one of the first questions. Um, can we use a water spray for air pollution reduction, reduce particulate matter? Um, technically, yes. Mod model technically saying not at the moment. At the moment, it does not interact with the field um, of fine dust because this is a pretty, pretty very um, difficult on phenomenon because um, you're going to cluster the air pollution. So that means if there is humidity, the, the fine dust, especially if you have PM10 or even smaller particles like PM1 and you have an air, um, relative air humidity about 70%, 80%, where you, which you can easily get if you use water spray, um, the particles also begin to change their behavior. They begin to cluster in, in larger clusters and they are no longer PM1, they are PM10 and afterwards PM50 or PM100. 
So this is the one thing, and then they also build up cluster with the water droplets, and then they, if they, this is a mixture of water and fine dust, and which is then going to the ground. So I think this is a very chemical slash mechanical physics problem. Um, I guess where we all we do not have too many equations for for that. So this is why no, at, not not at the moment. So technically, yes, there is of course an influence between water spray and pollutants. Um, especially for particulate pollutants, but also for gaseous pollutants, of course. Um, but it's really, really complex. Okay, um, then we have another question here. Is any of the water sprayed recycled? Um, ye, I would not recommend it. <laughs> this is what I say, yeah. If you do have really good gray water, um, uh, you mean, I, I'm not sure, do you mean um, is the source of the original water left or is it collected from somewhere so if you do have a fountain yes of course so um, things which are not evaporated and falling down to the water surface of the fountain um, is of course going back into the um, the, sim the system and um, the question how is the water then kept clear and clean in this uh, sprinkler in this um, fountain depends on the system so some work with ultraviolet lights other works with chlor chlorophyll other works with other means to get the, the, the water clear but in any case before you spray the water back into the air or even if you bring the water back to the surface you have to be 100 percent clear that this water is has, has no bacteria that this water has no um I just switch over to the other pc screen so um that this water has nothing in it that people definitely do not want to inhale. And yeah, is if operation calculated, yes, of course, uh, this is the, the, the main principle. If we do not calculate an evaporation, we can of course or not calculate on um, the cooling effect. Okay, that is another question. How does the water spray feature integrate with other components of MRI, like the vegetation or building models to provide a comprehensive uh, yeah, it's, it's basically the same. Um, we have um, uh, we interact with the plants. So if we um, have a water spray that is hitting a tree or a bush, we know how much of this water is um, formed in liquid form on the leaves, and it can then be transpired from the leaves back again. We haven't done that for buildings so far. Because in, in most cases, it's not really relevant because if you have a fountain, it's normally not so close to a building that it does interact with the building. Or if it is a waterfall which is integrated in the, in the building and the, the manufacturer of the waterfall have taken care that is not, no humidity is going into the walls of the, of the buildings, definitely. So I'm going to move forward. Yeah, yes, yes, surely, yes, sure. Everything in um, in Envimet is um, calculated according to the time of day. Um, depending on the air temperature, the, the solar radiation, you can also set the emission rate. So you probably have not been on board when we talked about the emission rates. So you can set um, for every time of the day, um, so every hour of the day, you can set an, an individual emission rate. And to say, okay, um, we use um, high, um, high fluxes of water spray in the afternoon when it's hot, and we use no fluxes of water spray in the, in the early morning hours. If you wanted to have it a bit more sophisticated, you can, of course, um, write a Python script, for example, in Data Studio um, to prepare the input files. So if, for example, you calculate a very windy day and your machine knows if the wind speed is above 10 meters per second on that day, you must switch off your water spray because it's just blown over the marketplace and it's not doing anything useful. But then you have to generate your own database and adjust the emission rate. So that's not done automatically by NVMAP, but you can do it in advance to generate an individual emission rate for this kind of, of day, for example. So, Toby, what grid size works best, I find, with this feature is the water released linked to the underlying surface when it will impact soil moisture. Um, yes and no for the last part. So if we do have a fountain, so this is normally 
attached to some kind of pond system, which is um, also normally uh, some kind of water feature. So um, probably if you have a, a situation where you just have the fountain and you have just regular um, surfaces around it, you can set, of course, these surfaces as wet surfaces in Envimet. So this is a, a typical uh, spe special kind of uh, surface type so that you can build something which has a realistic um, situation that your surface gets wet. But it's not calculating exact water balance between your, as, I don't know, your um, asphalt surface or your granite surface around the, uh, the fountain to see when it is wet or when it is um, not wet. I don't know if this would be interesting to do, but we have not yet worked on that one. Yeah, what grid size works best? It's just made it. It's the same like for everything. So um, the, the the king the king grid size resolution is always about one to two meters. So that is when everything works best in NVMet. Um, but of course, if you have a three meter resolution, or for for Athens, I think it was um, even a four meter resolution. That's that's still still okay. So I don't. It doesn't produce numerical issues. It's just the case that your model area starts to get very coarse. And of course, your field of analysis then also has just four meter steps. And maybe you wanted a bit more um, concrete or a bit more high resolution. <clears throat> it's possible to calculate the turn effect of a water body, for instance, in a section, while evaporating the exterior envelope who is designed for hot air to be intaken. I mean, except for France, is it possible to Reproduced water. I'm not sure if I got the complete question. I could, I understand the last part of it. Yeah, we can produce water bodies. Um, there is a, a very nice paper written by um, our Dutch colleagues on this called um, Are Urban Water Bodies Really, really Cooling? It's also, also open source. If you go to ResearchGate on, on my page, for example, um, and look for it, you find it's from 2020 or so. Um, where it's really hardly discussed um, about what is the effect of urban water bodies. And if there is somebody who knows about urban water bodies, then it's the Dutch people. And so they did a lot of experiments in the different forms of water they have in their cities. And the, they didn't use fountains. Um, they have just looked at the water bodies. And their, um, their conclusion, and this is also already a bit mentioned in the, in the in the title of the papers, are urban water bodies really cooling? And the the question, uh, the answer was uh, not really, because they do not interact much with the air if there is no fountain, and during the night they are normally warmer due to the heat capacity of water. So it's not really a good tool to cool down the the surrounding airs, but it looks nice. So that's maybe a point why it is used frequently. But in the night, of course, um, it's the same effect. You can also calculate it in Envimet. You can, you can also look at, at the nighttime situation. The question is, of course, um, when it comes to the nighttime, um, if the evaporation really works as expected or if the water vapor pressure is, the gradient is not, more, not, um, not high enough to get a satisfactory result for that one. OK, so there we go. Can we still can we use still water like a pond instead of yes yes sure so this is just a, um, a, a surface type in, in Envimet we call we call it deep water um, why why do we call it deep water a pond is not deep water but it's just for a very simple reason because we do not calculate the the secondary energy balance at the ground of the surface so this is just a very shallow pound pound it would probably be heated from the ground much more than heated from the solar radiation going through the water. And this would result in pretty complex model things. So we have just said, OK, we assume or we anticipate that the pond is so deep that the solar radiation is not reaching down to the ground of this, the pond so that the heating effects from the ground surface from the pond is not taken into account. Uh, but the other, the other settings you can set, um, again, this paper, Our Urban Water Bodies Really Cooling, also explains how to um, um, set the, the vertical mixing of the water body and how to um, um, define the turbidity of the water body, because these are two effects which really drive these, um, the distribution of um, water temperature. And then in the next step, of course, the, the energy and the latent heat flux from the surface.
Yeah, I think my, uh, this is what I just meant. Um, deep water is, is a water which is deep enough so that the solar radiation is not heating the bottom of the pond in a significant way. So this, this could be about two meters or so, or it's just an approximation to get rid of the situation that we need to define a secondary heating source at the ground. And then because if we define the secondary heating source of the ground of the pond, then we have um, to ask ourselves, um, what is the pond bottom looking like? Is there gravel? Is there alg? Is there a rotten bicycle? So it could be anything in it. So it does not get better if we introduce this balance. Yeah, sure. Um, so these components of EnviMet, you can combine, combine them in any form you like. So there is no reason why not doing that. I just wanted to keep that simple. So I have... I think I have, oh, there's no marker. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I will put it in as a, as a banner in here. It's been written by Coy Jacobs. Actually, I'm not, pretty, I'm not sure if Core was the first author because it was a, a, a group of, I think, five or six um, authors. But if you put, if you paste in our urban water bodies really cooling, um, I think there will be just one hit that fits that. Or you go to my research gate page, it's also uploaded there and you can directly um, download it there. Very, very interesting paper. Also a bit conversion because many people think of water as a cooling element not thinking it's a water mist, but thinking of still water bodies, and it's mm, a bit difficult. Yeah, okay, guys. So um, thank you very much for, for attending. I think this hour is over. We uh, hope it was not a, a too big rush. It's also recorded and um, you probably can also put in comments on, on the LinkedIn page of this event and that we're happy to, to answer them um, even after this stream is finished. So um, I haven't used that studio function a lot. Maybe in the next um, technical demo, we use the studio function a bit more so people can come in and show up in, in person if they, they want to. Um, so I, I guess it was um, pretty pretty nice to use this um, new streaming platform, StreamYard. Um, um, I will wait for your comments if you think it's a good solution, or if you say now Zoom is much better. I don't know what the, the quality was, or if it has to be some glitches from from your side, because I just basically see see myself at the moment, and um, I look the same in, in Teams, Zoom, or StreamYard. Okay, so thank you very much and enjoy the remain of the week and have a nice weekend and see you later on. Bye.